and welcome to Tools for Everyone. This is an opportunity to learn a bit more about the philosophy and an overview of the skills that we teach in Tools of Choice training. Uh, my name is Kathleen Deppler, and I'm going to be your presenter today. I am the Director of Positive Supports for the Division of Developmental Disabilities, and I have been facilitating uh, Tools of Choice for almost 10 years now, maybe 10 years in May, and I often tell people that it is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Uh, and so I'm really excited to share with you uh, some of the content and uh, overview today. So I uh, would love if folks would orient themselves to the WebEx here and find the chat box and tell us who's here. If you could uh, share your name and maybe where you're uh, joining us from, um, that would be great. And I'll just give you a, a few moments to find that uh, chat in the lower right corner of your screen. And uh, when you use that chat box, if you could just share, just use the everyone, uh, send it to everyone versus just the panelists or the host, that would be great so that everybody can, um, can follow uh, the chat box together. So just take a minute and uh, share who you are. Thank you, Sarah, Howard County, cool. Carrie Miller, welcome. Ooh, some more folks from Howard County, welcome, Heather. And Karen, welcome. And Nevada. So Michelle in St. Louis, and Mary from Pettis County, great. Amy uh, Norman from uh, Kansas City and Alex also in Kansas City. Welcome. Okay, we got folks from all around the state. That's exciting. Welcome everyone. In, and Kate in the boot heel. <laughs> uh, great. This is a nice uh, crowd here today. I'm excited to have you guys. So before I go on, I really want to preface this with, um, this is again, an overview of uh, tools of choice and um, it is not intended to replace uh, your positive behavior support expectation. If you're here uh, for that, then you really need to look for a full course that has all of the components required for that. So um, today is an overview and a really, a, a opportunity to learn more about the philosophy and a couple of the strategies that we talk about in that class. So for the best experience today, uh, everyone stay muted. You kind of have to because it's not turned on where you can turn it off. Um, and I would really encourage you to grab some paper or open up a document um, for you to take some notes on your uh, computer. And um, so for notes, and we're going to do a couple of activities and having something to write it out um, might help you in doing that. So, <clears throat> so overall today, uh, things that you will learn are what is a universal strategy um, and uh, positive behavior supports. We're also going to talk about a few fundamental facts of behavior, so um, just some general guidelines that really um, inform all of the uh, the content that we're going to share today. We're going to talk about how to categorize behavior so that we all uh, really know what we're talking about and are on the same page, and, and it helps us target behavior for change. We're also going to talk about coercion and punishment and uh, why you should try to avoid it, which will become clear when we talk about the effects of coercion and punishment. Uh, and I'm gonna give you 10 examples of commonly used coercions uh, that I'm gonna ask you to avoid in the future. And, and uh, also gonna share a couple of proactive skills that you can use to improve your interactions, improve the behaviors in the environment, and really improve your relationship with, the, uh, with people. So positive behavior support. I said I was going to explain what positive behavior support is. There's really a lot <laughs> that goes into this definition. So the science of behavior or behavior analysis has been formally investigated and demonstrating the science of behavior since the 1940s. There are hundreds of 
thousands of studies and demonstrations of the principles and techniques uh, and many programs and treatment projects, schools, training curriculums use the principles and techniques developed. So positive behavior supports uses the public health model to structure interventions. So if you look at this triangle down here, I'm going to use that as a as a visual for this. Uh, that green base there at the bottom represents universal strategies like tools uh, that support the quality of life for an entire population. And in a healthy population, 80 to 90 percent of people will need only that universal uh, support in order to have a high quality of life. So then if you go up to that next level there and you see that yellow center that represents the population of people who are at risk for poor outcomes and the interventions for this population often look like an extra scoop of that universal support strategy so uh, those are intended those targeted interventions using one of those universals in a targeted format uh, with a person at risk is intended to be a short-term intervention and faded as risk decreases so in a healthy population 10 to 15 percent of people will need that level of intervention that that uh yellow extra scoop level and then you see that red at the top and um, that represents those in crisis and in need of short-term intensive supports. And in a healthy population, 5% or fewer of people uh, might need that level of support. And, and so it's important to gauge today's content in that green universal level. So um, that's what this Tools of Choice content is gonna be. It's this universal stuff that everybody needs in order to have a high uh, quality of life. So, Sometimes it can be difficult for people to accept this approach um, uh, because uh, there's an impression that we're letting people uh, get away with things. When in fact, we're really just shifting our focus. The focus is on being kind and caring all the time. We want to avoid creating a, a worsening. Um, so that means that we keep our cool. We don't take things personally or emotionally, even when they definitely feel personal or emotional. Um, and we try not to do things that get even or try to get back and hurt someone. We try to avoid those, which is really hard. Um, it takes lifelong practice and um, even those who teach, <laughs> uh, we're still working on it. Um, my goal in life is to avoid coercion for a whole day. It's very difficult. It's the the uh, coercive practices are are in our movies they're part of our culture uh, music video games our penal system uh law enforcement religion it it's intended uh it's it's a, a shift in our focus and it's definitely different than uh practices that we were raised with so um that can be difficult for people and i would encourage you to keep an open mind and um of and uh, think about uh, the important relationships in your life as you go through this and how um, engaging in this way might impact those important relationships that you have. So let's start getting on the same page about what we mean about behavior. So this is an opportunity for you to, for you to use your chat box again. And some folks let me know that they are only able to um, chat box with the panelists. So I'm just going to read things that come through uh, so that everybody can uh, hear what folks are saying. So tell me, use your chat box. What, how would you describe behavior? How, what's your definition of behavior? If you were going to explain behavior to somebody who doesn't uh, speak the verbal English language, how would you do that? What is your definition of behavior? Michelle says communication. Uh, Carrie says actions. A person takes. Uh, Don says communication as well. Vicky says how I conduct myself. Amy says communication and actions. Mary says reactions to an environmental factor. Uh, Deborah says attention getting. Amy says gestures. Uh, there's definitely some themes here. Uh, communication being a big one. The way we interact with others. Karen says. Um, that's great. So definitely some uh, some common themes here. And these are great. So 
let's look at my uh, very formal definition here of behavior, which is anything a person does that can be measured and observed, that can be seen and counted, okay? So that's really uh, a pretty broad uh, uh, or a more broad uh, definition uh, than we typically think about behavior. Uh, oftentimes when we talk about behavior, we really just think of that undesirable stuff. Um, and so we want to shift our focus to be more broad than just trying to stamp out a behavior and get rid of it. We want to focus on desirable behavior and shift that, that culture in our environment. So let's talk about some behaviors. Uh, use that chat box now. And I want to fill this blank slide here up with a variety of behaviors. So tell me what some behaviors are, some things that you see. Uh, I see shutting down. I'm going to start there. And I'm just going to type what folks tell me. So. Shutting down. Yelling. You guys are going fast. I like it. Headbanging. Running away. Anger. Stomping. Throwing things. These are great. There's so many here. I like it. I'm going to have to go back through my chat box up here. Using to comply. Using care. Or participation. Pulling. Crying. These are great. I'm going to run through my chat box one more time to see if I lost some things. Verbal outburst. Hitting, someone said. I'm going to add a couple of my own here. Oops. Excitement, Angela said. Okay, I added a couple here too. So now as you look at this list of behaviors, I am going to take a pink marker or some color marker that I find here and I am going to circle a few things or uh, I want you to look at the things I'm circling. And again, you can use your chat box to tell me what do you notice about the words that I am circling, okay? Carrie, thank you, Carrie, for rescuing me from my very, very poor uh, <laughs> ability to use this uh, paint function here. So, yeah, the things that I am circling are negative. They're, they are undesirable behaviors generally, um, high stress responses, Alex called them. Um, everything seems in a negative context, Amy says. Yeah, they're, they're seen as bad, um, Heather said. So, when we think about behavior, that's typically what's on our mind, isn't it? We typically think about undesirable behavior. And um, so this, uh, the practice of tools is asking you to shift your focus and really expand your definition of behavior and start thinking about the desirable things that you see in the environment. Uh, that's going to be where we have our real opportunity to build a relationship and to encourage desirable behavior to happen in the future. So I'm going to get rid of my um, green circles <laughs> and I'm going to shift to uh, another, I'm going to circle again um, and this time I'll use blue um, and I might just make a little um, a little mark next to it this time. Uh, the circles were kind of difficult. So when you uh, see what I, when you look at the things I'm putting um, a little blue mark next to, tell me what you think about these that's different from the ones that I am not. 
What do you notice about these? This one's definitely a tougher question, so I'm going to give you a few minutes. I think I have. Kayla says they're physical. Karen says they're actions. Yep, they definitely are. Vicki said that um, they might demonstrate a person um, out of control. Yeah, they definitely, um, these are all difficult situations. So what I noticed about, what I noticed um, about the ones that I put the blue next to at the, is that they're not specific enough. They don't, they're not things that I can measure and observe. They're not things that I can see and count. They are big old categories that really might look different depending on who the observer is. So for me, um, a, a verbal outburst might require the person to be swearing and um, and using a, a, a painful decibel uh, and um, be very close to you. But to another person, a verbal outburst might simply be a loud swear word or a scream. Uh, it really looks different based on whoever it happens to be observing. And so one of the things that we want to be sure that we do when we talk about behavior is talk about it in a way that everybody can understand what's happening in specific actions rather than that a big old category like shutting down being a big old category. Um, or, or self harm. There's lots of different ways that somebody could harm themselves. And so being specific about what uh, the behavior is, is really helpful in making sure people are on the same page. So here's an example on the screen about uh, saying that I was being rude. So uh, someone could say that I was being rude, uh, but that could be so many different things, right? Um, versus identifying the specific behaviors and saying Kathleen was staring at this person. And um, she said so loudly said, so everybody could hear said, look at them. What was she thinking? So, yes, certainly it would be very rude to do that. And if we're going to think about targeting my uh, big old category rude behavior for an intervention, it's really helpful for everybody to know what that looks like. So when we talk about behavior, we want to talk about it in measurable specific terms in, in terms that can be seen and counted. Now, sometimes it can be helpful to use a category. And so we have defined four categories of behavior that uh, we use when we think about how we might respond to the behavior. And so based on the category of behavior, we would wanna respond in a particular way. So the four categories of behavior that we have are here on the screen for you. And on the left, you can see two types of desirable uh, behavior categories. One being significant. So those are the big things. That is the big deal behaviors. Um, those things that that improve a person's quality of life uh, or their independence, their autonomy, those big deal behaviors. And then right below it, you see the just okay. The things that, um, you know, probably really aren't getting a lot of attention in the environment. Uh, but if they don't happen, it's probably a big deal. Like it's a just okay behavior to shut the door when you come in the house, right? But if you forget, then it's a kind of a bigger deal that the door is wide open, right? And so the just okay behaviors when they happen uh, don't tend to get the same level of um, response as when they don't happen. So that's one way to think about that. And that's an opportunity for us to continue to expand this, uh, this uh, vision that we have of what behavior is. We really wanna start thinking about what are all those just okay behaviors that we just kind of expect to happen uh, in an environment, and we're not really doing anything to uh, reinforce them and uh, and um, increase the attention that we're paying to them. Uh, that's a great way to start to shift our environment is when we start to to pay attention to those just okay behaviors. <clears throat> so, two types of desirable behaviors: significant and just okay. And then you see over here this undesirable categories, and those are things. Uh, I, I find it easier to talk about serious uh, before drunk. So serious is anything that's physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. And um, 
And then under that, you see the junk, and that's anything that is um, not physically harmful to themselves, others' property, or illegal, but is annoying, is um, unhelpful to their goals. It is probably socially unacceptable uh, or, uh, you know, um, not helpful to them um, making friends and um, definitely unhelpful. So, you know, annoying is written here. I think that's an important way to think about junk. It's that stuff that is not helping a person um, expand their skills or, or reach their goals and um, is probably annoying to other people around them. And that really is a lot of where we spend our time. I think if we went back to that list, let's do that. Let's go back to our list right here that we made. And some of these things are not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal, but are definitely not things that are helping them be successful. You know, um, stomping, pacing, um, uh, saying no, uh, anger, verbal outbursts. Those are not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal, but they're definitely not helpful to reaching your goals. So, we also want to think that, we also want to remember that, um, you know, depending on the context of the environment, it, a behavior really could fall into any of those categories. And when I look at this, um, I think, um, so here's a good example. Um, for me, go, going to the gym would be a significant desirable behavior. It's not something that I do regularly, but something that I'm working on. And when I do it, it should really get a big payoff because it's not happening routinely. And, but Michael Phelps, uh, it's just okay when he goes to the gym. He does it all the time. It's not a big deal. And he still needs an attaboy for his hard work and going to the gym every once in a while. But it is not the kind of big old significant behavior that it would be if I did it. And then uh, the person going to the gym just to leer at people and, and stare at them that they're working out, that's annoying and junk. It's not physically harmful, but it's definitely not helping them socially. And, um, and that would be considered junk. And then uh, the person, the athlete who uh, just had surgery to fix their their ankle um, and they uh, are back out there exercising before the doctor said they should go back. That's serious. It's phys it could be physically harmful to themselves. Um, and so that would be serious. So that same behavior of going to the gym, depending on who the person is, depending on that context of the environment, could be in any one of those. And that's important to remember as we continue to discuss the types of behavior. So significant. These are the things that we're trying to teach uh, these are the things that we're trying to increase in the environment. So let's go to the chat box. I would love to hear about what are some significant desirable behaviors for your environment. Things that you want to teach, model, motivate, increase. Things that will improve people's lives. Relationships, Vicki said. That is a great one. Uh, res mutual respect, Alex says. Significant desirable behaviors for the environment. Following through with tasks, being patient, uh, meeting needs, being aware of others. So significant desirable behaviors, things that, that uh, will improve a person's quality of life, adapting to change in environments. That's a big one. I like that. That's a good one. <clears throat> Accepting those changes. I like it. Okay, so uh, positivity to change. So those are the things that are gonna help everybody in the environment, gonna help people be more successful. Those are significant desirable behaviors. Those are great examples. And then there's that just okay stuff. And again, these are commonly overlooked. So there are so many just okay behaviors. Uh, we usually don't happen and we're often kind of um, taking them for granted. And I think the door shutting is a good example because we take for granted that someone's going to shut the door, but when they don't, it sure, it sure uh, gets noticed, right? Um, so we're not paying it off when they do the right thing, but we're often noticing when they, when they don't do that just okay behavior. So let's come up with some of these. What are some examples of just okay behaviors in your environment? Just okay behaviors. Things that are desirable, but they're not uh, 
they're not the things that the person is actively working on to increase. Um, they're just kind of the expected behaviors showing up on time for most people. Um, working through feelings. For some people that could also be quite significant then letting that build up and you're going to deal with it. Some just okay behaviors at my house would be um, putting the lid down on the toilet. Most people do that. If it doesn't happen, it's kind of annoying. Someone's going to notice. Um, for most people, uh, washing your hands after you use the restroom or before you eat. Um, spitting in the sink when you're brushing your teeth. For a toddler, that's significant desirable behavior, but for most people, it's just okay. Leaving, folding clothes, yeah. Putting your dish on the counter, clearing, clearing the table. Yeah, those are great. So then let's talk about that annoying junk stuff. Now remember, these are things that are not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal but they are definitely undesirable behaviors that are hindering the quality of life of the people and in the environment. So what would be some junk behavior in, in your environment? Showing up late to work. Um, what are some junks? Burping, arguments, um, throwing your clothes on the floor. Wow, you guys are coming with this. I, yeah, this is great. Swearing. <laughs> um, uh, all afternoon, throwing trash on the floor. Those are great. Yeah, having a messy room. Those are junk behaviors. They're not physically harmful, but we're probably spending a lot of time on them, and they're definitely not helpful to our relationship or to that that uh, the the social interactions and environment. Uh, mimicking people. Yeah, that really a lot of these. Uh, it's important to remember that most of these uh, qualify as definitely annoying. And at some point, they might have been age typical, but the person didn't learn the skill that they needed in order to replace that annoying junk behavior. You know, everyone burps, but we do it quietly at some point. We learn to keep it in. We learn to cover our mouths, right? So um, oftentimes, it's really a matter of the lack of replacement for that behavior. We haven't taught the thing that needed uh, the person needed to do instead. You guys are coming at it. I let you... That junk behavior is really where we spend a lot of our time. And I think the fact that we all have so many examples of junk behavior speaks to how much time it really takes us when we're dealing with that junk behavior and we're and we're focused on it. And so tools is so helpful in expanding the behaviors that we're going to focus on and helping us pay off those just OK everyday behaviors um, and really putting more focus on those happening in the environment so that we can focus less on the junk. So uh, you guys gave me a lot of those. Here's some examples. Um, I think we came up with some of these cursing, threatening, not going to work, not being respectful. Uh, that can look like a lot of things, those two. Uh, slamming doors, screaming, name calling, saying mean things. So one thing that we can do is help understand why people engage in junk behaviors why is a why might a person curse at another person why might someone complain about the food why might someone slam the door so let's come up with some reasons let's think about this so in the chat box when you think about a person who swears why are they swearing francie says frustration definitely attention karen says yes attention frustration um, swearing is common in the environment. They're unhappy. They're hurt. Misunderstandings. They feel like they're not being heard. They don't know how to properly express themselves. They haven't learned. They haven't expanded their vocabulary. That's their habit. Yes, you guys definitely seem to understand. Okay, so what about um, complaining about food or their peers or complaining in general? What what? Why might people do that? They dislike things, yep. Attention, jealousy, uh-huh. Habit, yep. It's different than what they're used to. Yep, these are great. 
These are all excellent reasons. You clearly understand why people um, do do these drunk behaviors. And then slamming the door, kind of the same thing I want to imagine. Tell me about why someone might slam the door. Someone says transitioning, they don't want to do something, anger. Yeah. So it sounds like you all, everyone has empathy. You all understand. You see how the person is feeling. And so you can identify why they might engage in junk behavior. Um, and if you think about how long people have been doing this junk behavior, uh, you can also see how it continues to happen. So, you know, someone said um, it's the environment they were raised when we talked about the swearing one. It was the environment they're raised in. They're just used to cussing. It's the thing they know to do to meet their needs. And that's how. Um, most junk behavior is it served a purpose and it's the thing they know to do to meet their needs. So, uh, you might have, you might, um, have heard it suggested to try to ignore, uh, those junk behaviors, um, or that junk isn't important. Um, and, and in reality, we really just have a, a tool called pivot. That's just a more effective way. It's not ignoring. It's avoiding reacting, and we're going to talk about that. So um, we really want to consider why the person is doing it, and we want to provide another response, and that response is pivot, and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. So what undesirable behaviors are not junk? These are the things that are physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. And remember, the reason we talked about how these categories is because based on the category, we want to provide a particular response. So I said for junk, we would really like to provide a pivot. And for serious behavior, we need to intervene. Someone could get hurt, something illegal is occurring, something, needs to, something different needs to happen. And so we have a tool called Stay Close Hot which I'm going to talk about today as well, for these, ser these serious behaviors where someone could get hurt physically, uh, property, illegal. Um, so we have an intervention for that. And again, that's the purpose of these behavioral categories uh, to determine the way that we, we uh, respond. So I said that stay close hot is one way that we can respond to uh, a serious behavior. And if that is not effective, um, then there's some more things that we can do. If that person has a safety crisis plan, we need to figure out, we need to start implementing that. And hopefully part of that is using stay close hot. Additionally, you can call 988 for behavioral crisis uh, uh, support. And um, that would also be a great response to serious behavior. So let's just kind of summarize this, these categories of behavior again. They are helpful in determining what our response would be. So here's some examples of significant behavior. Uh, mixing the ingredients for a cake, reading a book, writing a letter, avoiding coercion when threatened. And again, depending on the person, those might fall in another category. Like, for example, mixing the ingredients for a cake for me would just be okay. It's something I've done many times. I know how to do that. Uh, but for another person, that could be significant desirable behavior that they're really working on. Um, and then there's the just okay. So things like answering a question, saying thank you, dancing to music. Those are things that are just kind of expected in the environment and they're not really uh, getting a big, a big, uh, a big reinforcer. They're not really getting um, the kind of follow up that um, they could. And so you thinking about those just okay behaviors in the environment, in your environment, are, is really helpful in uh, creating that shift to moving beyond just thinking about behavior as undesirable stuff that we want to stamp out and thinking about um, behavior as anything a person does. And there are so many opportunities for us to provide positive consequences for us to shift the environment into really being focused on desirable stuff. And that just okay category right there is how we're going to do that. We're really going to expand that uh, that category and thinking about all the behavior people do. And then there's the serious stuff. And you guys came up with a few of these. Hitting, hitting someone, that's serious. Taking your clothes off in public would be serious. Hitting your head on a hard surface would be serious. Those are things that are physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal. And then there's this junk stuff, and this is where we're spending a lot of our time. Um, and these are things that really get a big reaction and our goal is going to be to to avoid reacting to them to provide a different response which would be pivot and uh, we're going to talk more about that so cursing spitting burping threatening to tear stuff up you know 
Um, those are things that are not physically harmful to themselves, others property or legal, but they are definitely unhelpful. And um, we have a response called pivot for that. So. So now that we understand uh, a little bit about how we talk about behavior, we talk every anything a person does that can be seen and counted as a behavior. And we uh, we're going to talk about people's behavior in measurable, observable terms, so everybody understands. And we're going to use categories of behavior to really determine our response and focus uh, the interventions that we might use. So, here's some fundamental facts that um, help us understand behavior. First off. Um, the behavior is always right. So, based on the person's history, their uh, physiologically how they're feeling, um, their their current situation that they're in, this is this is the reason they're doing the behavior. That is responsible for the behavior. Um, uh, and they're, they're, people are engaged in the behavior that they know to best meet their needs. So based on their history, based on the current environment, this is the behavior that they know to meet their needs. That's what we mean by behavior is always right. Not that they did the, the right thing and it was so good for them to do that, but that this was the right behavior that they knew to use to best meet their needs. And I think that that's really helpful in understanding that a person does not willfully do something against us or is bad, um, but that's the thing that they learn to do to meet their needs and that formed their experiences from watching others. And, um, and we can teach and model and motivate alternative behaviors for people to, to use, uh, but just understanding that the behavior that they're engaging in um, is what they've learned to do to meet their needs. The next fundamental fact we have is that um, a consequence is anything that happens after a behavior and and that consequence can either strengthen the behavior and make it happen more often or um, with more intensity or it can weaken it and make it happen less often or uh, with less uh, intensity behind it. So um, the only way to really know what the effect of a behavior is is to look at what happens in the future and if that behavior continues to happen, then that consequence is motivating it and is uh, positively reinforcing it. And if that behavior does not continue to happen in the future, then that then that consequence, uh, what what so what happened right after the behavior was a punishment, and it is going to weaken and make that behavior less likely to occur. So really looking at behavior over time, and uh, seeing how those consequences. Um, impact the likelihood of that behavior to occur again in the future. And so when you think about this, it's important to think about what's that desirable behavior that we want to see more of. And then what's a positive consequence for that person? And how can I provide a positive consequence after that desirable behavior occurs so that it's more likely to, to strengthen and continue to happen more in the future? So number three, Patience, patience, patience. People have been doing, you know, especially when you think about like junk behavior, people have been doing that, that, that swearing or picking their nose or whatever that junk behavior is. They've been doing it for a long time and it's going to take time for the changes that we make, the changes in the environment to change the behavior. So patience, consistency, um, and, and here it says take data. And I think that's really important. Um, in really being able to see changes over time. Um, if you have a, a number associated with how many times that thing is occurring, it's a lot easier to identify. Um, so it doesn't have to be anything, you know, uh, magnificent of, of, a, of a study to just take some data and see over time how things are happening. Number four, past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. So remember, People's past experiences is what's is what's determining their behavior and and um, uh, driving that, and so um, they're likely to use that same behavior again. Uh, we can anticipate those things if we know that um, when um, when so and so calls, it usually is not a fun call. I can predict what's going to happen when the phone call is over, and I can work to uh, prevent the fallout from that difficult phone call. 
um, I can I can provide an intervention. So I think this is really helpful in kind of empowering us that um, that there are things that we can prepare for and um, intervene in a way that's going to um, be less likely to create a difficult situation and more likely to help de-escalate anything that does occur. Uh, this next one, uh, giving, using coercion or trying to punish someone, creating a worsening for them, it stops the behavior. It could stop the behavior in the moment, but really it creates long-term problems. Um, and we want to avoid providing a negative worsening for folks. We want to avoid um, uh, making things worse for them, making things more difficult. And again, I'm going to share 10 examples of coercion, and those are really common ways that we tend to respond uh, when we see undesirable behavior, but they often do create this worsening for people and, um, and can really create more undesirable behaviors. And here's my last one. In, in the long run, behavior responds better to positive consequences. And so that's what this is about. That's what tools is really encouraging you is to expand the uh, your definition of behavior to include everything a person does, to really think about those just okay behaviors, to think about the significant desirable behaves, behaviors, to recognize those, to provide positive consequences for them as often as possible, as often as possible. That is what can really create a shift in the environment away from the undesirable stuff and the junk that tends to get a lot of um, to get a lot of attention. We're going to focus our attention on the the just OK stuff, the things that are happening in the environment um, that we want to see continue. So. Um, let's think about. Um, let's think about a time or if, if you've had a, an experience with a difficult boss. And, um, you know, not the person you work for now, uh, you know, what was it like to work for them? Did you work as hard as you could? Uh, did you did you work as hard as you could all the time or just sometimes when they were watching? Well. Carrie says, I cried and found a new job. That sounds about right. Yeah. When you experience coercion, you got to get away. Panic attacks, terrible things happen when you work for someone who focuses on the negative, undesirable stuff, stress, stress just to be around them. Yes. So it sounds like people have had this experience that like was driven, ooh, micromanager. That's another way to describe that, isn't it? Just like really focused on, on those little things. Um, worked harder to avoid reacting to them. I'm going to do everything I can to avoid it. I'm going to, you know, um, cry all the way to work. Uh, you know, uh, call people call in sick more often when they're dealing with that. And then think about a time that you've worked with or for a person that was positive and encouraging. And uh, who'd you work best for? The encouraging boss never wanted to fail them. Alex says, I appreciate that. Like, that's the person you're working 120%. You're like, I am going to impress them. I, the, I'm going to give them back that same positive, that same encouragement, uh, you know, becomes like a two way street there. Um, you stay longer, you stay longer. You're there 11 years because it's that place that you want to go and, and be with, and you have their back. I love that, Vicki, that makes so much sense. Like it really becomes this like reciprocal thing. So in the long run, responding and increasing the amount of positive consequences that are happening in the environment is going to get you more desirable behavior. And that's what we're looking for here. We want it for ourselves and we also want to put that out there. And that's really what this universal positive approach is about. So it's important to remember that triangle again and know that this is for everybody. And it's really the basis of all the other interventions that a person might uh, might need. So, you know, we talked about those folks who were at risk or in crisis. Without the this positive, uh, without this these positive universal practices, the implementation of a more targeted strategy just isn't going to be as effective, because they're really not getting just that basic stuff that everybody needs. So, it's really important to think about that and. 
and we're not trying to fix people. We're really trying to increase the quality of life. So this word here that you see on the screen, discipline, similar to um, behavior, often gets pigeonholed into a, a punitive kind of connotation. When in reality, math is a discipline, science is a discipline, English is a discipline. It's something that you learn. Uh, it's something that's taught. So uh, if you're using punishment as your discipline, you're teaching and modeling and motivating exactly what you don't want. Uh, and so when we think about discipline, we want to think about modeling and teaching and motivating the desirable behaviors that we want to teach and increase in the environment. And so discipline really is a positive thing. Discipline is doing the same um, skill or practice the same way each time, the correct way, right? So math is a discipline, English is a discipline. These are skills that you learn and are taught. And that's that's the way to think about discipline in that positive way. So if you're again, if you're teaching through punishment, you're going to really hurt your relationship. Um, and um, it's a really an ineffective method of, of discipline. So we want to teach and model and motivate what we want rather than the behaviors that we don't want. And to effectively change behavior, we really need to define and identify those things that we want to see. So what are we going to teach? What are we looking for? And what are we going to attend to uh, in, the, in the environment? What are those desirable things that we're looking for? And those are going to become our target behaviors. And so, uh, you know, this last bullet point here is really the way people tend to think about desirable behavior or uh, target behaviors. You know, they're thinking about these things they want to um, they, they want to get rid of, they want to weaken, they want to decrease these uh, target behaviors from occurring, um, and they just focus on replacing it. When we really want to expand that definition of target behaviors and think about those skills that you want to teach, what are the alternative behaviors? Those, uh, what do we need to teach people, and what are we going to pay off that's desirable so that we can strengthen and increase those things happening in the environment? And that's how we're going to motivate desirable behavior by really just emphasizing and putting more, more of our time, more of our energy, more of our responses or our consequences into, um, into after desirable behavior occurs. That's when we're really going to engage. That's when we're going to provide those positive consequences. And that's where we're going to spend our time looking for reasons to provide those positive consequences. And in a time when um, undesirable things are occurring, we're going to try to pivot, and if we must respond, then we're just really going to minimize the way that we respond. You know, um, we're going to avoid the emotional. We're going to avoid um, too much of an a, a, a correction. Uh, if we have to say something, we're going to say it minimally, and we're really going to use pivot. So hopefully, we're not having to respond to the junk anyway. And then we're going to motivate by teaching the behavior that we want to see by helping people learn the new skill. We talked earlier about how uh, junk behavior, most of it was at some point age typical. And so it's really a matter of the person not having learned that new skill and replaced it. Um, so we're gonna teach uh, desirable, healthy behaviors and we're gonna focus on them. And, and then we're gonna also make sure that we're associating uh, like them doing this desirable behavior with like an improvement that occurred. What's the impact? of them uh, engaging in that desirable behavior that we really want to point out the, the good things that occur for people after they engage in desirable behavior. So we're not going to focus on the undesirable. We're going to be uh, non-emotional if we must respond. Um, we're going to be, um, we're going to provide as little of that kind of uh, response as possible after undesirable behavior. And instead, we're going to shift our focus to looking for the desirable, healthy stuff. And we're really going to start thinking more about those just okay behaviors that are occurring in the environment and really trying to figure out how we can pay those off. So this is going to cause us to have to change our focus and shift the way that we're interacting in the environment. Um, 
we're going to have to really be patient and think about um, how long a person's been engaging in that undesirable behavior and um, how hard people need to, to work to practice and learn a new skill. So it's not going to be um, overnight. It's, it's uh, slow. And uh, we're going to be patient. We're going to look for improvement, not perfection. So, um, you know, shaping towards that, 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 uh, the greatest version of the behavior you're looking for just steps in the right direction, looking for improvement. And, and patient again, down here at the bottom, we're just going to be really, really patient. It takes time. So, talked about uh, the categories of behavior. We talked about expanding our definition of behavior um, and really thinking about target behaviors in a broad sense of uh, not just pigeonholing into the target behavior you're trying to get rid of, but um, expanding to the desirable stuff that you want to see more of and that you're going to teach and increase and model and motivate. So, these are things we're going we're gonna to do. Now we're going to shift to talking about coercion and its effects. And these are things that we're going to stop doing. We're going to avoid doing. We're going to start to recognize when we're doing it and we're going to make a plan to do something different next time. So this is kind of a difficult section because everyone's going to see themselves in one of these. We're all coercive. Our society is coercive. Um, it's the way we were raised. Um, and it's often our knee jerk reaction. It's not something people plan to do. It's just the thing that we know to best meet our need in that moment. It's kind of our own junk behavior. So let's talk about that. Coercion is a way that we punish a person. It's a way that we uh, tell the person that we don't like what they're doing. Um, and it is hurtful for our relationship. It is embarrassing to the person. Um, and it has some some really uh, negative effects that we're going to talk about. Uh, we say it ages you, that it causes a person to avoid you, to get even, or to escape the situation. So um, really unhelpful things. And and it's our goal for teaching and discipline to be um, to avoid coercion. So the authoritative imposition of something unpleasant or negative. So punishment. Um, in response to a behavior deemed wrong. That's that's this kind of uh, coercion that we're providing. It's a way that we punish. It's force, uh, sometimes verbal. It's a put down, a show of disrespect. And again, habitual reactions. These are not things that we plan to do. They're just the things that we're used to doing. So again, you're going to see yourself in here and I'm going to see myself in here too. Um, so here's our 10 examples of coercion, and I have a slide about each of these, so I'm not going to go in super in depth right here, but questioning, arguing, sarcasm or teasing, force, verbal or physical, threats, criticism, despair, lecture, logic, taking away, and talking about bad behavior. So let's start with questioning. This is uh, asking a rhetorical question, something you did not want answered, and I think with this one, Thinking back about that body language and tone of voice, like there's so much here. Uh, you know, you can ask what time it is. What time is it? Or you could ask, do you know what time it is? Right? Do you know what time it is? Or do you know what time it is? I have two totally different uh, intentions behind me asking that question. And when I said, do you know what time it is? I did not want you to answer me. I wanted you to recognize that you are late. Uh, so this is a way that we're telling people that we don't like what they're doing without actually coming out and saying the thing that they need to do uh, correctly. It's asking, again, asking a question you didn't want answered. Um, and really, I think in this case, uh, a lot of body language that can hurt. <laughs> um, so arguing. You're never going to convince Uncle Bud of your point of view. You, you, that conversation starter uh, did not need to happen. Uh, that going back and forth between two people trying to convince them that they're wrong or that they should see the way that you look at things, it's not going to be effective. It's going to start an argument. It is damaging to your relationship. Um, it also can be really motivating to people. There are people who really, uh, you know, want that. Uh, and so um, you 
you might be motivating a, a more escalated environment by engaging in that kind of behavior. So if you recognize that you're going back and forth with someone, recognize exactly what it is. It's arguing and it's coercive and you can stop. Sarcasm and teasing. And um, I think this one is, is really hard for people um, because we are a really sarcastic uh, culture. Um, so sarcasm is, is saying really the opposite of what you mean. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of times when people are using sarcasm or teasing, I, they're not like trying to be malicious or like, you know, mean to the person. Um, they're trying to like make light of the situation or, uh, make it more comfortable for them. When in fact, like any time you use sarcasm or teasing, it really is at someone else's expense. Um, and so even if you think the person is in on it, um, it's still really not a helpful, uh, it's still coercive because it is not helpful and it's not a social skill that just anybody can utilize. It's really pretty complex um, to, to um, say, say the opposite of what you mean and have that person still understand what you're saying is a really complex thing. So it's also not something that, it's also us being a poor model of of how people can behave because it's not a social skill that just anybody could use and so we're modeling things that are very unhelpful it's confusing and, and misunderstood force uh so um you know uh that physical force is abuse certainly within our system um and in uh when I think about verbal force or verbal aggression, you know, just saying things loudly or very close to someone in an intense way. Um, and I think that one kind of flows really well into the next one, which is threats. So telling somebody that, you know, X, Y, or Z terrible thing is gonna occur if they keep doing what they're doing or reminding them um, that they won't earn this thing if they continue on. So reminding them of the, the bad thing that can happen. If they continue, that's a threat. And then criticism. And this looks like someone's, you know, you have a better way they could do something. You want to teach them how they could do it uh, more efficiently or effectively. Uh, and you'll wait until they already started doing it their own way to tell them that. That's criticism. So they've started something, they're working on it, and then you come and tell them how they could do it better. It's really defeating for that person um, and is gonna be taken as criticism. It's it's not gonna motivate them to keep going and trying next time. And um, um, so when I think about this one, I think you know, you're like watching somebody sweep the floor and it is not going well. There's still like all the dirt in the corners that didn't even get touched. And you're like, well, I have a better way to do this. I could, I could tell them about that. Um, and if you do it right, then it's going to be really defeating and could be coercive. So the thing about avoiding coercion can often be making a note to yourself that like, whoo, before she goes to sweep the floor again, I am going to teach her about my idea where you, uh, you know, draw a big X in the middle of the floor with some tape and we're going to sweep everything into that X. And we're going to talk about how you start in the corners. Uh, you know, you have a way that you could teach and it's really about creating that moment to teach. So if they already started doing the thing, they need to continue getting to do the thing. And if you try to come up with a better way or show them how they could do it better, it's gonna come off as criticism. Despair, despair, I give up. Oh, it's the Eeyore problem. Um, you say, and like you, you act like you don't know what to do, you're hopeless. And you know, if you're, you're coming from a professional standpoint for the professional person to be uh, without hope of your improvement is, a uh, really uh, pretty difficult um, situation and doesn't doesn't lend itself well to anybody in the environment having hope. Um, so, you know, things like uh, after somebody does something you dislike or um, or, well, I guess I guess we're just not going to be able to do that. I was really hoping and now this, you know, you did this thing and now we can't do it. You know, uh, just telling someone uh, uh, that you give up and you don't know what to do next, those kinds of uh, comments, despair, um, really just bring the, the environment down and, and tell the person, why try? It can also be really motivating. 
uh, you know, if, um, if the person is unhappy or dissatisfied with you, uh, it can really, your, your could really be reinforcing to them and like, I got you. I, I saw that you didn't like what I did. And so it can also be really motivating to people, which would not be great for our relationship. So another way that we tell people we don't like what they're doing in an ineffective way is to lecture and logic them. And this is like the Charlie Brown teacher where you just keep on reminding them of all the reasons that you're doing this or, um, you know, talking too much in the situation, uh, telling them things they already know, you know, uh, and again, we're doing generally we're doing these things after they've engaged in undesirable behavior. So, you know, handing somebody a tissue and be like, can you use a tissue after they, you know, they're picking their nose and you you hand them a tissue and tell them they should use a tissue. Well, it's not like they never saw a tissue before or didn't know that that was the thing they were supposed to do. It's really just a logic lecture at that point. And, um, and, and it's not helpful. It's not going to make the person more likely to use that tissue next time. And this one and uh, all of the coercions really are really focused on that negative. They're focused on the undesirable behavior that's occurring. And so we uh, want to avoid providing that kind of um, response or consequence after somebody's engaged in undesirable behavior. So that's another reason that like, if you find yourself talking too much or trying to explain, uh, it's probably just really not the best time for it. And honestly, after talking to you guys for an hour now, um, and I've had some, you know, you guys have used the chat box a few times and we've interacted, but it's really difficult to keep, uh, you know, uh, talking without sounding like you're lecturing. And I think especially in talking about coercions, because again, these are all things that we all do and have done um, in response to people's undesirable behavior. So um, if you're talking more than the person, if you're talking too much, if you've repeated things they already knew, you're using lecture and logic, if you find yourself doing that, stop taking away so this is things like um you know time out would be an example of taking away because you're taking away somebody's opportunity to interact with others taking away privileges or um or that toy that was causing the problem uh taking away money these are uh you know damaging to your relationship they're telling the person you don't like what they want and they're really just uh making the person feel more uh, difficult things. The things are not improving here. We're creating a worsening for somebody by responding by taking away. And then our last of the 10 here, talking about a person's bad behavior when they're there. So um, do you know what your kid did today? That kind of thing right in front of them. I think this one happens a lot at uh, shift change or when you're picking somebody up from school and the teacher comes to tell you about it or um, uh, really lots of times. Uh, so, so sharing a story or telling somebody about what had occurred right in front of the person um, is coercive and damaging to your relationship. So we talked about the 10 examples of coercion, and I told you that once we talked about the effects, you would understand why we ask you to, to avoid using coercion. So here's the effects. People avoid you. And that means that um, that's really something that kind of happens in the future. You know, um, if every interaction that I have with um, Sally, we um, she ends up talking about my bad behavior and I just have to keep hearing about, um, you know, the, the the things that I did that were bad and I just have to keep hearing about it. I'm not going to want to be around Sally. I am going to avoid her. So that's one thing that can happen is that people just avoid you. Another thing that can happen is that they get even, and this is really common. So we know that coercion meets coercion. And I don't mean always that arguing meets arguing or talking about bad behavior turns into them telling somebody about your bad behavior. It's not always that you get that same uh, coercive back. It's that coercion of some kind is going to meet coercion of the uh, of some kind. So, um, you know, that can really escalate quickly, especially depending on people's social skills. You know, I might talk about somebody's bad behavior in front of them and they don't have um, the skill set to to, uh, you know, address that with me, but they're going to provide some other form of coercion right back at me. Right. That can escalate really quickly to, um, you know, I talked about bad behavior in front of them and then they hit me. 
or you know use some other form of of coercion against me people get even coercion meets coercion and again it can really escalate a situation additionally people who are experiencing coercion try to can try to escape the situation so oh i just can't be here anymore i can't deal with this person they just keep coming at me i got to go i just i got to go so that's similar to avoid except that escape happens in that moment in that interaction and avoid is really like a long term kind of thing that um happens uh in the future so they're you're going they're going to be less likely to want to spend time with you later escape is they are less they don't want to spend time with you right now and they're getting out of this interaction people also learn coercive behavior so remember we talked about discipline math is a discipline science is a discipline etc um uh, when we use coercive tactics as our form of discipline, we are being using punishment, attempting to use punishment, and uh, people learn that kind of coercive behavior. So um, we're really attending to and re uh, helping people receive attention for their undesirable behavior. That's totally the focus when we use this coercion. It is a response to undesirable behavior. And people also behave less confidently. And the example that I like to use here is um, there's an episode of a, a famous episode of Seinfeld um, called The Soup Nazi, where uh, this is just like, you know, this is really special soup place and uh, in New York City and and Seinfeld loves their soup. And, um, you know, so he goes there, but this man who runs the, the, the restaurant is very strict. And if you step out of line or do something in his restaurant that he doesn't like, then you're gone and you're banned for life. Well, Seinfeld loves the soup. <laughs> and so he wants to keep it. And this man, Seinfeld stands up in front of thousands of people. That's confidence. You know, he could stand up in front of thousands of people and, um, and is a, is a pretty confident person. And when you watch this episode, you just see him cowering in the soup line just not wanting to make any kind of mistake because he really wants his soup and so an effective coercion is that people in that environment behave less confidently they they don't know how they're what kind of response they're going to get and and uh and therefore are just less confident and and people who are People who are not confident don't make great decisions. The more confident somebody is, the better decision they're gonna make. And so if we are using coercion and we're causing people to be less confident, we're less likely to get that desirable behavior that we're looking for. So let's think about times that were typically coercive. Again, these are um, unplanned responses um, and, uh, and they're things that we know, uh, depending on the person, we can plan and prepare for them. So let's think about when are we typically coercive? And sometimes we use the term hangry. When I'm hungry and angry, <laughs> I am more likely to be coercive. When I've been uh, encountered my pet peeves, um, when someone's being coercive to me, that get even response is common, right? When I'm frustrated or having a bad day. So there's, there's things I can prepare for and, and recognize that that is why I'm feeling the way I am. That's why I, that's what I really need to guard against and identifying if I'm using coercion. Uh, so when I'm hungry or angry or lonely or tired, I really need to, um, to consider that that's how I'm feeling and identify that and make, take steps to avoid using coercion during those times. So knowing when you're at risk can be really helpful because you can plan and you can practice other ways to engage versus the typical coercive response that we might get. So why do people use coercion? If coercion causes these problems that we were talking about, we were talking about the effects of coercion and they're causing this avoid, get even, escape, people behaving less confidently. Nobody really wants that. So why are we using it? And we're using it because in the moment, it appears to work. It might stop that behavior in the moment. It might. And it'll produce long-term problems. It gets short-term compliance, but it creates long-term problems. So we really want to identify times when we're more likely to be coercive, identify the kinds of coercion that we often use ourselves, 
and we can make a plan to avoid using those things um, and to prepare ourselves that oof, sometimes when I am in, when I am met with uh, this, I am coercive. So what am I going to do next time I met with this? I'm going to and use a positive uh, skill and we're about to get into some positive skills. So if it's not coercion, what do I do? <laughs> and we're going to make a plan. Um, so think about what triggered it. What happened that um, created the situation when the undesirable behavior occurred? What happened? I might be able to identify a common trigger and therefore be prepared. Like the kind of example we gave earlier was like, you know, every time somebody talks to uh, so-and-so on the phone, it's a difficult conversation and, um, and that's something that I can, that triggers the undesirable behavior so I can be prepared. I can make a plan for next time they talk to them on the phone. I can think about what the person's getting from this undesirable behavior. You know, when we did that earlier, when we talked about, um, you know, why is the person engaging in these drunk behaviors? You guys all identified many reasons people are engaging in undesirable behaviors. So think about it. What's that payoff that they're getting? What what's what about this is working for them? And think about in other situations or is it every time that the person is met with the situation that they engage in this undesirable behavior? Or are there times when they have done the desirable behavior? Are there times when Johnny is, um, you know, gotten really upset and instead of, um, you know, having uh, uh, yelling very loudly and um, hitting people, instead he has noticed that he was having a difficult time and he used his coping skill Are there times when he's done that? And if there are, what kind of response did it get? Did it get the kind of response that if he engages in the other, in the undesirable behavior? Is it, are we, are we uh, paying off that desirable behavior that sometimes happens as well as we're responding to the undesirable behavior? Then consider what does the person need to learn to do? You know, does he need to learn uh, uh, a coping skill like this? Or does he have that and he maybe needs to expand it? What do you want the person to do in the situation? What can we teach them? What do they need to learn to do? And then think about what could change in the environment. What, what could change in the environment that would make that trigger less likely to occur or um, make that desirable behavior, that coping skill more likely to occur when difficult times are happening? Can we have some cues in the environment for that? So there's some considerations. The things you can think about uh, to avoid coercion and you can build a relationship and we have a tool for that and it's called stay close uh, and we, we talk about stay close in a few ways we talk about cool random routine and hot so it's important to think about that because there's so many opportunities to use this so there's a couple you're probably already doing you're already using you know something good happened to the person something exciting happened they told you great news i'm going to be an aunt or uh you know i got a promotion you know that's an opportunity to engage with that person it's a relationship builder um you're using that opportunity we would call that a cool so you res you respond to people um, when something cool happens an improvement in their lives you're already probably doing that and then there's like the routine time so you know, regular things that happen in the environment that are your opportunity to build a relationship. So dinner time or, um, you know, the ride home from work or school. Uh, what are those routines that happen in the environment that you can use as a cue to engage, to build your relationship? Then there is random. And this is really where it's important to consider because uh, you know, in a cool or in the routine, the person kind of understands why you're you're engaging and having that kind of meaningful conversation. Something good happened or you're just, you know, headed home and you're having this great conversation. But in a random, that looks like the person, nothing the person did uh, cued you to go have this meaningful conversation, this relationship builder. Um, you just cared enough to want to come and talk to them. And that random has a really big impact and so i say random it's random to that person you're engaging with but as you uh, learn and implement it might really not be random to you it might be that you decided today is a four day and so uh when you see four on the the clock 
you are going to engage with someone. So at four minutes after the hour and 14 and 24, you're going to find somebody to do a stay close with. That person doesn't know that you today's the four day and that's why you came up to them and started talking to them. They just know that you care and want to engage with them. So cool, random, and routine. Those are your opportunities to build your relationship and practice the skill of stay close anytime. And it's really going to help you and be important that you do use every opportunity that you can because the same skills that will help you get through a, a difficult time are the ones that you can use all the time to build your relationship. So these relationship building skills are also de-escalation skills. And um, that means that you're going to be ready to use those to de-escalate a situation because you've been practicing them all the time. So let's look at what these skills are. This is a stay close interaction here. So move towards the person. That makes sense. It's really difficult to have a meaningful conversation from across the room. Um, and just that the impact of you walking towards a person is a, is a physical demonstration that you care. Touch if appropriate. And again, if appropriate is big here. So depending on the person, not everybody likes to be touched, but here's some like general ones, handshake, uh, you know, touching their arm or their shoulder, giving high five. Um, those are, those are uh, meaningful in a way, again, a way to demonstrate that you care. And then I'm going to lump number three and number four here just to be about body language. So you're mindful of your facial expression, your tone of voice, relaxed body language. Um, you know, you're really saying more with um, your body language than you are with the words coming out of your mouth. And if I, I think a good example would be if I taught this class by just saying, so you can use a stay close. And when you use a stay close, you'll build your relationship. Here's how you stay close. You ask open any questions, empathy and encouragement. No one would get out of this class that I care about what I'm facilitating. You would not understand um, how important it is to me. Um, the impact of what I have to say is uh, quite decreased uh, without the uh, body language, my tone of voice, and, um, and my facial expressions. Those are all expressing to you how important this is to me and, um, and, and increase the value of, of this interaction, of this time. So uh, number six, seven, and eight are the big ones. We call them O, E, E. And in tools class, we spend a lot of time practicing these. So open into questions. The intention here is to keep the conversation going. So your goal is to ask more a question that's going to get you more information than red, blue, or, you know, more than just a simple one word response. Uh, it's, it's there to keep the conversation going. So if you find yourself asking closed ended questions and getting that one word response, uh, did you have a good day? Yes. Well, tell me more. You can always follow up with tell me more to keep that conversation going. So open any questions and then empathy and encouragement. And these are really, really important. And I actually have a slide about each of these. So empathy is identifying the emotion that someone is feeling and naming it. You're telling them that you see that. And then there's encouragement. And that is identifying a desirable thing the person's doing and telling them uh, what that means for them. So how could that improve their situation or what does it mean um, that they're doing that? Uh, desirable behavior. And then you're going to listen. Uh, you know, the goal is to talk less than the person um, and avoid changing the subject or the topic. And then I'm going to do the same thing I did with three and four and lump 10 and 11 together. We're going to avoid coercion and we're going to avoid reacting to junk behavior. And that's really the same thing because we went over all the examples of coercion and they are how we are responding to junk behavior. So we're going to avoid coercion and we're going to avoid respond reacting to the junk behavior. So empathy is taking understanding the emotions of others and uh, and, and naming them. So uh, this might be something like um, you seem over the moon. You seem tickled pink that those are like big deal things. That's like more than excited, right? So finding words that really reflect the gravity of, of a person's emotion is really important. And it empathy tells the person that, um, that you understand them. Empathy is the connection between two people. And so you're communicating to that other person that you see them, that you understand their point of view. Um, and that's, a, that's something that makes people want to keep talking to you. 
what makes it so that you're the kind of person they want to tell things to. You see them and you understand them. And then there's encouragement. And this really looks like you identifying it's something desirable that they're doing and naming it and telling them that what it, what it means for them in the future. So, you know, um, if the behavior was studying hard for a test, man, you studied so hard and you walked in there so confident, you know, you knew what was going to be on that test. You were ready. You know, that that is exactly what what uh, happens when you study for a test. And so telling them, uh, encouraging them that that's that that studying is going to help them be confident for that test. Um, you know, uh, encouragement like, uh, man, you got finished with all your chores early and now you have more time to watch TV. <coughs> and when it comes to encouragement. You really probably need to ask some open in questions and make sure that you really have a good. Uh, picture of of what's happening in the environment before you um, provide that encouragement. So really a good opportunity opportunity um, to be used towards the end of your conversation, or um, at least after you've learned uh, information from your open ended questions and provided some empathy about how that person's feeling about it. So let's do some practice. I'm ready to take you back to the the, the chat box, and uh, we are going to practice providing. Come, let's come up with an empathy statement. And an encouraging statement for awesome Alex. He just passed his GED. He he just got the results back. And you have been there. You know that he studied for hours to prepare for this GED. And now he's passed. And you're walking down the hall. And here he comes with this piece of paper. And he is going to show you that, look, I passed this GED. I did it. I did it. And you're going to provide him an open and a question uh, or an empathy statement and an encouraging statement. So I'm going to wait. While folks come up with these, go ahead and put them in the chat box for us. Oh, Amy says, I know it must have been so hard to study. And look, you did it and you passed. So she really reflected that way he feels. Way to go, Kim says. And she used that high five. That's a good touch right there. <clears throat> um, ooh, ooh, these you guys are coming fast. Uh, Vic, you're, I, you should be so proud of yourself. So proud of yourself. Uh, you worked so hard. Your hard work really paid off. What do you think it means for Alex? What's some encouragement we could give him? Okay, I know you spent a lot of time studying and you did a great job and passed. <clears throat> we, you knew we could do it. You totally got this. These are great. So uh, when you think about encouragement, really telling him um, what it means. So, uh, you know, in this case, man, oh, man, you studied so hard and now you've finished, uh, you you passed your, D, your GED. I know that... Um, you can keep working so hard and before long, you'll be putting that to good use. You know, what's it mean that he got the GED? It probably means he could get a job. I don't know Alex well enough to know if I should suggest that to him. Uh, but um, see where hard work gets you. Yeah. Where does it get you? It gets you good things like passing this test. You got it. Okay. So this is a great example of a stay close school. That's the opportunity here. Something good happened to Alex and we are going to be with him in that moment. Let's talk about just okay, Justin. Uh, you're eating in the break room and he, uh, moves some papers to let a peer sit down and he smiles at you and says, hi, when he sees you. So what's a, uh, op an empathy statement and an encouraging statement that you could give to Justin. He's moved some papers to let a peer sit down and, and he, uh, as you're walking in and he smiled at you and said, hello. What's an empathy and encouragement statements you could give him? Thank you. How have you been? So there's a good open-ended question. That stakes more than, uh, you know, he might say good, but you could say, tell me more. Um, you Thank you. I, uh, thank you for making room for me. I know you're busy. How you doing? Francie says. <clears throat> you look like you're having a good day, Justin. Mary says, um, that was very kind of you. So you're identifying that that was a nice thing to do. It's some good reinforcement there. Um, how are you doing today? Good open-ended question. Looks like you're busy working, Carrie says. Good. Uh, <clears throat> that's a good um, empathy statement right there. You see that he, uh, you know, all those papers mean he's probably pretty busy. A gentleman, like a real gentleman, Justin, Alex says. So you're identifying for him like this thing that he did. You're paying it off. You're identifying how he's feeling about it. 
Um, looks like you're happy to see your uh, your peer there. Um, okay, so now let's talk about some more difficult times. We know that in uh, the good times, we're going to use that to ask open-ended questions, give empathy and encouragement. And in a difficult time, when someone's engaging in junk behavior, we're going to work on pivoting around it. We're going to work on avoiding providing one of those coercive consequences, one of those coercive reactions. And instead, <clears throat> we're going to pivot, which is going to help us avoid paying it off. Um, so again, you guys, we talked about this a little bit earlier uh, in the why do people engage in those junk behaviors? And you guys came up with things like attention or a reaction. Um, you also said things like it's what they know to do, which I think is a really uh, important thing to think about. So what's the payoff uh, of doing that junk behavior, attention, getting you to comfort them, or reaction, the coercion meets coercion idea uh, <clears throat> uh, to make you go away or get even, a power trip, Vicky says, make you do something for them. It's what people do. Um, so it's really important to remember the why um the why people are doing it and it's also important to remember that it, these things are annoying and um undesirable but they are not physically harmful to themselves others property or illegal and they're not putting people at risk and so we can have some room there for a different response and that response is pivot um and it's important to think about that and it's important to to avoid reacting because what we know is that with serious behaviors, so things that are physically harmful to themselves, other property or legal, they often stemmed from a junk behavior getting reacted to and that coercion meets coercion getting ramped up and now we're at serious behavior. Now we're at things that are physically harmful to themselves, others property or illegal. So that's that's a big motivator from my perspective for pivot that it really can help de-escalate, keep things at a at a um, a safe and calm environment. So how do we pivot? Well, first we're going to avoid we're going to be mindful of our body language. Uh, think of all the ways that you respond when something's going on. You know, woo, uh, your face can say a lot. That the the sigh under your breath says a lot. So think of all those things that you're doing. Uh, you know, physically backing away, uh, having some kind of response. So think about that and avoid providing those. Just take a breath and avoid it. And then you can use one of a few, uh, one of our three pivot options here. So one would be uh, use a pivot to another person. So you're actively attending to someone else. And I think this is a really good one for a situation in which you come in and, and one person's on task and another is is off task. And uh, you know, uh, oftentimes people will go and 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 uh, try to get that off task person back on task. And then we've missed an opportunity to create a positive environment and focus on the desirable behaviors we're looking for. So a pivot to another person would be focusing on that on task, that person who's working on task. And uh, when we see the off task person um, start to engage in a desirable behavior, then we can pivot to them. And that's step and that's step three, which is to pivot back to the person. Um, so that's that's option A, pivot to another person. Uh, and notice the word subtly. So this is not the old, uh, can't you be more like your sister kind of business. <laughs> it's someone's on task. That's the person who's going to get my attention. When the off task person engages, it starts to get on task, then I'm going to pivot and bring them in. Uh, option B here is pivot to an activity, and that's my activity. That's that I'm going to focus myself on the work that I'm doing until I see, until in the, my, the back of my, the side of my eye, I see some desirable behavior uh, beginning to occur or the junk behavior stops. And then I'm going to go to number three and pivot back to the person. And then there's the, the last option here, uh, C, pivot on the person. And that's just continuing to talk to them as though the junk wasn't happening um, and focusing on the desirable behaviors that, that are occurring. Um, so, you know, if a person is actively, uh, is actively working on chores and complaining, uh, I'm going to focus on how much effort was, was working. Um, so, you know, they're sweeping the floor and I don't know why I'm sweeping the floor. Your staff, you should do it. Uh, Whew, there's just so much work. This well, this was a lot of work. There, there's so much dirt on this floor. And look, you got it all all in the circle here. Wow, this is a lot you've accomplished. 
you know, I'm just going to focus on what they have been doing and avoid reacting to uh, the junk of uh, complaining about it and telling me that I should be the one to do it. So those are my three options. I'm going to pivot uh, on another person. So focus on the desirable behavior occurring in the environment of another person without comparing them. It's again, and it's not that can't you be more like your sister. Um, I'm going to, I could pivot to an activity. So focus on the activity on my own activity uh, until um, until I see the desire, some desirable behavior occurring or the junk stopping, or I could pivot on the person and just keep talking as though the junk behavior wasn't occurring or, um, and then, and then in that case, I'm not going to do step three because I'm still engaged with them. So step three is um, after the junk stops for 10 seconds, I'm going to pivot back to them. I'm going to, attend to something desirable that's occurring. I'm going to provide a positive consequence for that. I'm going to pay attention to it. Um, and I'm going to repeat this pivot, this avoid reacting using uh, another person or my own activity or, or sticking with this person uh, for as long as necessary. Again, people have been engaging in these junk behaviors for a very long time. It's unlikely that one pivot, one avoiding reacting is going to be effective in, in um, in shifting to more desirable behavior. So I'm just going to keep at it. I'm going to keep avoiding it. And I want to point out that this is a universal strategy. Uh, and pivot is not intended to solve all of your problems. It's to help you get through this moment, this moment where this junk is happening. So if you find yourself pivoting the same behavior over and over and over again, it's time for another skill. The person needs to learn something. They need to learn the thing to do instead. So we have a, a skill called set expectations. And so if you find yourself pivoting that same behavior over and over again, it's likely that another intervention is needed like set expectations. So why pivot? Why not just ignore it? Ig ignoring it is coercive. Um, it, uh, it can be really reinforcing. Um, and it can cause this thing, the behavior per se. So, oh, you don't see this? You're going to ignore me? Well, let me show you some more. And things really escalate and get out of control from there. So pivot really helps because um, it, it, it attends, it's looking for desirable behavior. It's focusing on desirable behavior. And that's going to strengthen it and make those things more likely to happen in the future. And it's going to weaken the undesirable behavior. It, when we are not reacting to that junk, it's less likely to happen in the future. It didn't get that attention. It didn't get that uh, response that they were looking for. Desirable behavior gets that. It also can prevent that behavior burst. You know, if, uh, if ignoring it can escalate things into, oh, you don't see this? Let me show you something else. Well, avoiding reacting is is not the same as as uh, ignoring, um, and they they will get that attention. You are going to pivot back, so it can help prevent that behavior burst, and it can also prevent escalating to serious behavior. Again, the majority of serious behavior stems from junk behavior getting reacted to, and getting even. Uh, coercion meets coercion. So um, it can help prevent that because we're avoiding providing that coercion. We're avoiding that consequence. So let's look at a couple examples here. Let's look at annoying Addie. Annoying Addie is, free, she frequently picks her nose and um, she's telling you about a cool package she just got and you're in the middle of typing an email. So I'm going to suggest to you that this would be a great opportunity to pivot on your own activity. So if I'm if I'm typing, that means I can focus on my activity. And I know Addie's over here and she's telling me about a cool package, but I can also tell she's got her finger in her nose. What's my opportunity? What am I looking for in order to shift and give Addie more attention than I'm currently giving her? Right now I'm focused and I'm really pivoting on my own activity of typing. What am I looking for in order to pivot back to Allie? I'm going to, I'm looking at the chat box. Um, what am I looking for? When Addie does what, I am going to shift my attention and focus on her. Yeah, 
Karen says when her finger's out of her nose. Exactly. When when Addie's finger comes out of her nose, I'm about to get real interested in that package. Until then, I'm typing and a hoing. I'm typing and providing a minimal amount of um, of interaction. Great job, Karen. Thank you. Okay, let's look at another one. Let's look at Outburst Ollie. Uh, so Ollie, Oliver and Sally are working on a project and um, Oliver's muttering things like, this is stupid, I'm just gonna tear it up. This is so dumb. And he's over here off task. And you got Sally who is uh, working and humming her favorite song. Who are you gonna attend to first? How am I gonna, how am I gonna engage in this situation? What would you do? Hum with Sally, okay, yeah compliment Sally ask Sally tell me what you're working on you're gonna Sally is your focus I, Sally is who is humming you're gonna praise Sally you're gonna you're gonna focus on Sally yes and tell me what are we looking for from from Oliver what could happen how how are you gonna know when to pivot back to Oliver when's our chance to engage him we're gonna focus on Sally and look for something with Oliver when Oliver participates in the activity, when you see, um, uh, ooh, you guys are coming really fast at me. Yeah, when he starts, when he changes his focus, then we're gonna, or or starts to be quiet. Um, yeah, there you go. When he when he sees a desirable behavior, exactly. So we're gonna wait for Oliver, and then when we see something like that, we'll pivot back to him. This is great, guys. You're doing really well. Okay, let's look at another one. This is our last one for pivot and then we're gonna shift to stay close hot. Okay, so here's our scenario. <sighs> Malcolm, it's time to go inside. And he screams, this is crap. I don't want to. And you can hear music playing and birds and you're outside. So there's lots of things around. What can you focus on to avoid responding to Malcolm? What can you focus on? Yeah, you can focus on the music playing. You can focus on the the um, singing or dancing. You can focus on the things that are happening in your environment. Um, you don't have to respond to the to Malcolm's complaints, the sky, the weather, uh, exactly. You have other things that you, and when uh, Malcolm starts to walk towards the house or inside, you know, whatever that looks like, uh, that's when we're going to pivot back to Malcolm and uh, pay off some of that movement in the right direction. Um, even when Malcolm just simply stops complaining, that might be our opportunity to pivot back to him as well, depending on how rapidly that junk behavior is occurring um, and what kind of <clears throat> time we have um, between the undesirable behaviors. Model, so Brandy asked if you can model deep breathing. Um, and I think it really depends on the level of the situation. And I think that's a really good question and something we talk extensively about when to uh, provide that model in, in the full tools of choice class. And in a few slides, I have a uh, QR code that you can scan uh, where you can learn some more about some, some specific opportunities to um, to bring in that coping skill idea. And in fact, here in, Set it, in Stay Close Hot, um, that's another opportunity we can do it. And, you know, I think Malcolm is a good example of um, a situation that many of us could identify, uh, could really escalate quickly. So if we respond to that junk and we try to, uh, you know, remind him about what's gonna happen when we get inside, or, you know, if you don't go inside now, then you're not gonna be able to go outside next time. You know, if we start in on those coercions, that situation could really escalate. I think we all, um, really could see that one getting out of control. And so it's kind of a nice one to shift into this stay close hot. So stay close hot. Things have escalated. Someone is having is things are not going well for a person. Um, a worsening has occurred in their lives. Um, and it's really about what they perceive as a worsening. So things have gotten worse from their perspective. And here's the skills we can use. They should look really familiar because they're the same as the ones we can use all the time. This is a stay close interaction. Uh, and there's a few things that we should consider that are a little bit different in this stay close hat uh, because things are escalated. So let's look at this. First, we're, first, first and foremost, we're gonna start with 
avoiding coercion. We're going to recognize that any of those forms of coercion are likely to make things even more worse for the person. And they're focused on undesirable behavior. So we're going to avoid it. We're going to avoid reacting to the junk. Usually, we're going to move towards the person. For safety reasons, um, you should consider safety as you do that is certainly in a stay close hat. And this is also another reason why using the skill all the time when things are going well as the way that you build your relationship is important because uh, the more often that this is just, you know, well, Kathleen just moves towards me. That's what we do when we talk. It's less likely to be taken as an aggressive response um, if that's just typically how we respond. So important to practice these skills all the time. Touch as appropriate to the situation. Um, Open-ended questions. If you need them so that you can learn about the situation, if you need them so that you can uh, keep the conversation going, uh, you should use those and be very careful in the questions that you ask uh, to avoid trying to fix it. Uh, that is a form of coercion. It would be a lecture in logic. So uh, really make sure that you, um, when you use open-ended questions, they're really to keep the conversation going and that they're necessary for that so that you can learn more. Um, Okay, listen, 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 listen. You really need to listen to what the person is saying and um, stay on topic. Avoid changing the subject with them. And then you're going to use those empathy statements. Uh, you're going to acknowledge the difficulty of the situation. I, many people, uh, when things are going poorly, don't want to provide an empathy statement for fear that they'll make it worse, when in fact, it makes it better. It tells the person that someone understands them that you get where they're coming from, that connection really can help people. So use empathy statements, uh, use encouragement statements. So, you know, if the person's been through difficult times before, uh, if they've been through something like this and they were successful, remind them of that. You know, you've been through tough times. I remember when you were really disappointed before and you did your breathing, uh, you know, just like you're doing now. If you keep doing that, I know that we can get through this. Um, so, Reminding them of, of a time when they were successful or something that they're doing right here in this moment that it, that will help them. It is not an opportunity to suggest that they do something different. It's it, that that's a, a, a prompt or a task demand that might really not go over well in this difficult time. So make sure that whatever you're encouraging is actually something that's happening right now. I can see you're taking those deep breaths like uh, like Brandy suggested, you know, you can model that deep breathing. If you see a little tiny deep breath, you can say you can notice it and you can model a deeper one. That's how you can keep it going. So there is an opportunity for that. Uh, and you're going to repeat, you're going to repeat until they're ready for the next step. So until you see, so you're going to repeat these steps open and in question, empathy, encouragement until you see the effects, until you see that the situation is, is starting to deescalate. And then you can direct to an alternative behavior or, um, you know, something that, you know, helps them cope. You know, sometimes um, when you're having a rough day, I know it helps to take a walk. Seems like you might be kind of feeling better. Would this be a good time to do that? We could take a walk. Uh, you know, it's really important that they've shown signs of de-escalating before you suggest that alternative behavior. It's not a redirection. We're not trying to get out of this difficult behavior uh, or this difficult situation. Uh, we're just trying to help everyone cope. So there's a time for that coping skill and it's after we've, it's either before we get escalated or after we have started to de-escalate. But if we just try to prompt that in the middle, it's, it's, it's um, unlikely that they're gonna be successful really using that coping skill. And then uh, use reinforcement after de-escalating. So, you know, I think a lot of times when something difficult happens, you know, in the moment we don't wanna provide that empathy or acknowledgement about how difficult the situation is. And then after it's over, we just never wanna bring it up again. When in fact, after the person's de-escalated, telling them, I, it was rough and you seem like you're really feeling relaxed now after such a tough day. It's, you know, now you seem like you're really having a good one. So reminding people afterwards and really beefing up that reinforcement afterwards is really important. So let's talk real quick about empathy again. Uh, we talked about it before. And it's just, again, telling the person how that, that you see how they're feeling. And again, sometimes in a difficult situation, people are hesitant to do this because they don't wanna make it worse. You will not make it worse. You will tell the person that you understand them and that connection will make things better. So let's practice one real quick. We're gonna talk about Sad Sammy. Sad Sammy had an argument with the roommate and we're having a tough time. 
that and and sometimes Sammy lays in bed for hours and um you know having an argument with her roommate is a really tough thing so um sh she is in bed crying and telling you that she needs a pill and you're in the living room so let's talk about an empathy statement and an encouraging statement uh that you could use uh with sad sammy yeah you want to you're gonna you want to try to get her to talk you want to have this interaction so what's an empathy statement how is sammy feeling right now let's tell her let's tell her what we see you're so upset Sammy, you're so upset. I hear you. Yeah. You're so upset. And and I want to be sure that I I tell her how I see that I see that she's upset. I don't want to ask if she's upset. I want to tell her. I want to I want to tell her I see you. Um Your voice sounds so sad, Sammy. I hear you. Really gonna uh, try to find words that reflect the gravity of the situation too. You know, if it was a particularly uh, difficult one, a difficult interaction, you know, or she sounds just, you know, like very, 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 very heartbroken, you know, really trying to use a word that reflects the gravity of how she's feeling is important. That's really gonna tell her that you see her and you understand her. So, um, so, so telling her, acknowledging, I see you, you are so upset. I can tell. And then, you know, it, it says here that she frequently gets upset. And so she's been through tough times, um, and she's made it through, she's made it past them. And so that's some encouragement that we could try to provide. How could we tell her that, like, that, that you've been through tough times before, and I think you can do it again, you know, and, and what are some things that she's doing? You know, if you go in and you say to her. Uh, Sammy, you're so upset. And she says, I am, you know, Johnny yelled at me and it was done. Uh, she's telling you just the fact that she's already talking about a difficult situation might be something that you can provide encouragement about. You know, this was a tough situation, Sammy, and you're already talking about it. It's, it's so hard to talk about things sometimes and you're already doing it. It's great. I know we can get through this. I know that you can. And giving her that encouragement. And again, it's really important when you're talking about that encouragement that it's actually things she's doing. So I couldn't tell her that if she, if I went in there and said, Sammy, you're so upset. What's going on? And she just stared at me. It would be very hard to find some encouragement then. You might have to really think about looking for those breaths and trying to um, identify a deep breath and then modeling it myself. So uh, we have talked about, we've gotten on the same page about what behavior is. We've talked about the uh, categories of behavior. So um, really trying to think about the context of that behavior and how we might respond. So uh, we, and we've talked about some skills to use based on the type of behavior that is. So just okay and significant, we wanna use stay close and we wanna use positive consequences. That's what we want to do with desirable behaviors, significant and just okay. Really expanding that response to just okay behaviors. And then we talked about responses for that junk. That stuff that's not physically harmful to themselves, others, property, or illegal, but is not helpful to the environment. Is not helpful to them socially um, and um, would be meaningful to their their lives if, if, if it wasn't happening. So that's the junk. And when we see junk, we're going to avoid reacting and use that skill pivot. And then we talked about serious behaviors, uh, you know, these worsenings and the skill we can use then, which would be stay close hot. And if things continue to escalate, we also talked about implementing a safety crisis plan or using 988 to help with a behavioral crisis. So we've gotten on the same page about what behavior is. We've talked about some things that we can do to prevent it. And before we leave today, I'd like to provide you with some resources um, because, again, today was just an overview of philosophy and a little bit of a uh, uh, strategy about things that you can do to to help Im increase the positive environment that you're in. So here's some resources that I want to leave you with. And this is the QR code I was talking about that if you have your cell phone and you want to uh, hold it up and, and use your camera to scan this QR code. Um, this will take you to uh, podcasts. There's 10 of them. And they, uh, one for each of the different 10 kinds of coercions, they're really great, not very long, pretty short, uh, and they're, they uh, 
our Dr. Ro Teresa Rogers, who brought tools of choice here to Missouri, and uh, Lucas Evans, who is the chief behavior analyst um, for the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And the two of them are talking about the common kinds of coercion that we see um, and what we could do to avoid that. I would also like to encourage you to attend a full tools of choice class. Um, really that we did a minimal amount of practice today. Um, and when you attend a tools of choice class, what you'll get is um, really a thorough uh, background for each of the different skills. Uh, followed by a practice session where you can come and interact with the consultant. Uh, you'll you'll um, have the opportunity to review the content that you learned in that recorded stuff in the um, in the the skill practice and, and information. You'll have the opportunity to review that, and then you'll have the opportunity to practice the skill and get feedback about your um, implementation from a consultant. And then. Here is a, a QR code for the family coaching workshops, and this is an opportunity for parents, family members, caregivers um, to uh, learn more about skills and uh, practice uh, and get feedback um, to support them in implementing these positive practices. So those are some resources I'd like to leave you with and. Um, um, I'm going to uh, I have a few minutes left, so I'm going to navigate here to. The chat box, um, I got a couple of questions. So um, Matt asked about um, getting this presentation and we are providing this presentation on a, a weekly basis. So if this is something that you're interested in, please send whomever you're uh, interested in sharing this with, please send them to one of our upcoming um, presentations of this. It's routinely available um, and um, they'll get the most out of it when we practice it all together and um, do it that way. So I, I say that to say, I don't have the presentation available publicly and I encourage you to come back and, um, and send whoever you would like um, to hear this information as well. And then, um, so a little bit more about the availability of tools of choice. So um, uh, tools of choice, uh, anyone at any time can watch that recorded content on the Relias portal um, on the DD website, the Division of Developmental Disabilities website. Um, any Anybody can watch that at any time. And I'm actually navigating there right now. I'm gonna put a link in the chat box for you to where you can find that Relias uh, material. So here's the link in the chat box. And when you navigate to that link, you're going to want to go under the tab that says Relias self-registration portals. And then the one that says uh, MODD content self-registration portal. And that's where you can register and search for the tools of choice, um, tools of choice courses in there. There are four of them. And Sarah asked if I could navigate back to the slide that had the 10 coercion. So I'm headed there now. And thanks for your patience. I think I'm almost there. I start, I am seeing the individual coercion examples, so I'm close. Um, and then Matt mentioned uh, at, that the next sec the next opportunity to view this content, I'm going to present this uh, material again on February 14th, and it is the same content, um, just another opportunity for folks to hear it. Thank you, guys. Um, this is the this completes our presentation for today and I'm going to stay here for a few more minutes just in case people have questions but otherwise thank you for joining me today and thank you for participating it really makes this class special so I really appreciate your time um, please share the opportunity with others or come back yourself thank you <laughs>